Christmas. Good to see all of you here tonight. Uh, tell me, is it still kind of wet out there? Yeah, yeah. We had uh, somewhat better weather in the morning. In fact, uh, I could make jokes about the fact that uh, a lot of people have come and asked me, uh, say, Pastor, did you bring the California weather with you? And uh, uh, of course, you know, I, I have to be honest with you. The, the answer to that question is, yes, I did. Um, and, uh, um, well, you know, we have really basked in some uh, much uh, greater than normal temperatures over the last few days. Uh, of course, this might all change in a few days, and you just have to realize that. My wife, Beverly, was uh, praying for this kind of weather because she had to be in the uh, living nativity scene and was really deathly afraid that she might freeze to death out there. <laughs> So um, she was praying for warm weather, and um, uh, you know, it, I, I don't know, I think it's in scripture somewhere, I'm not sure, but something about um, the uh, fervent effectual prayer of a righteous Californian avails much. Um, so anyway, um, uh, once again, it's uh, great to see all of you here on this uh, relatively warm Christmas Eve here in Waseca. Uh, tomorrow we celebrate Christmas morning, of course, at 9.30 with a ceremony of lessons and carols. That's also a Holy Communion service. This week, the office will be officially closed tomorrow and um, unofficially closed on Tuesday. And so please uh, make note of that. Um, I will need to be leaving town uh, for a short trip uh, December 30th through January 3rd. Uh, December 31st, next Sunday, Pastor Dan Sully will be officiating and preaching here, and um, uh, I know that uh, his message and his presence here will be a blessing to all of you. Uh, because of the uh, festivities this week and next, Bibles and Brew, which customarily meets on the first Monday of the month, will not be meeting on January 1st due to the fact that it is New Year's Day, and uh, we 
wouldn't expect a large crowd that evening at, uh, at the Ward House Brewery. Uh, the annual congregation meeting is coming up on January the 21st. That day we will have just one service again in the morning at 9.30, followed by a delicious meal, and then after that, uh, the meeting. So please put that on your calendars. These are the announcements. Once again, we are concluding the season, to, season of Advent and opening the season of Christmas, and we do so by the lighting of the candles on our Advent wreath. As you will notice, the four candles are lit. The first candle, which was lit, is customarily called the candle of Help me out here. Candle of Hope <laughs> and the Prophets. Uh, the message of the Prophets, which foretells the coming of the Christ child. The second candle, which is lit, we refer to as the Peace Candle or the Bethlehem Candle. And on that particular week, we recall the travels of the Holy Family from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That's called the Peace Candle. The third candle is called the Gaudete Candle or the Joy Candle. And on that particular Sunday, we celebrate the shepherds who first were the first ones to receive the Christmas message with joy in their hearts. And then finally, the fourth candle is called the love candle. And on that day, uh, and that was this morning, we celebrate the coming of the angels with the good glad tidings of peace and joy and love. And now, on this evening, we light the Christ candle, for Christ is born in our midst. So, uh, with that, will you please uh, rise as you are able with me? And let us open our celebration of Christmas Eve tonight with prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, we thank you for coming into this world, this world which is so beset by sin, this world which is a place of darkness, and yet this world which is so beloved by God the Father that he sent you to be with us and to come and be the bridge between us and the Father. And by your sacrifice upon the cross, your blood shed, and by your resurrection and your ascension, Lord Jesus Christ, you have accomplished all of this for our sakes. We are here tonight, Lord Jesus, to celebrate your coming into the world, incarnated as God in human flesh, to accomplish all that had been promised all that we might hope for and all that we dream of in the future. And so, Lord Jesus, hear the prayers of gratitude which come from our hearts and fit us and complete us through the coming of your Holy Spirit upon us as we celebrate here this evening. For the sake of your glory, for the sake of your gospel, we pray it, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Remain standing, please, for the invocation and the start of worship proper. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in Christ, be it this Christmas Eve our care and delight to prepare ourselves to hear again the message of the angels in heart and mind to go even unto Bethlehem. Amen. Unto us, the child is born. These prayers and praises let us humbly offer up to the throne of heaven. O oh. oh, splendor, the Father's light, with all the creatures on earth, we sing and rejoice at your birth. Christ is born, salvation has appeared. Our opening song is, O Come, All Ye Faithful.
us prepare our hearts to welcome the infant Savior with faith in true repentance. Please take a few moments in silence as you bring your prayer of confession before the throne of God's grace. I confess to Almighty God that I have sinned and so have tried to live without you as if I didn't need you. However, in the radiance of your love, dear Father, you have shown me my true need. For the sake of your only begotten Son, Jesus, the incarnate Word, grant me the forgiveness that he gained for the whole world in his holy birth life, suffering, death, and glorious resurrection. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. I declare the grace of God to all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Son, Jesus Christ. 
Grant that as we joyfully receive him as our Redeemer, we may with sure confidence behold him when he comes to be our judge. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue to worship by the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Good evening. Our first reading tonight comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 10 to 14. God sent a sign. The word of the Lord come to Cain Ahaz, encouraging him to be a bold and to ask for a sign from the Lord. Ahaz, in his stubbornness, refused to give God, ask God for a sign, claiming that that would be putting God to the test. Ahaz discounted the reassurance that the Lord was offering him and continued deeper in his sin by rejecting God's offer. That sign was nothing less than Emmanuel, God with us. Reading from Isaiah 7, verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Here ends the first reading. Our psalm for tonight is Psalm 110, verses 1 through 4. I will read the first verse, or the even odd verses, and you, you will read the even verses. Reading from Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning and the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Our second reading for this evening is from 1 John chapter 4. God loved us. First St. John makes it clear that we love only because God has loved us first. God sent Jesus to be the savior of our lives and the one who grants us forgiveness. The love of God is what empowers us to love like Jesus, sacrificially and unconditionally. Reading from 1 John, Chapter 4, verses 7 to 16. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Here ends the reading of the second lesson. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel.
Together we proclaim the Alleluia. The angel said unto the shepherds, Behold, I bring you joyful tidings, for unto you is born this day the world's Redeemer. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. We sing together, angels we have heard on high. seated. And once again, Merry Christmas and the Lord be with you. (laughs) You don't know how to answer that one, do you? It's kind of a twofer, isn't it? 
Sorry to do that to you. I don't mean to uh, engage in any trickery with you, especially on Christmas Eve. That's for other times of the year. Um, at any rate, uh, it is Christmas Eve, and I want to say congratulations to all of you because you have made it, almost. If you think of Christmas as a kind of a marathon run through the latter part of November and up through December, I have to tell you that you have made it almost, almost. Um, you know, just think of all the stuff that you've had to do, the dozens and dozens and dozens of details that you have had to take care of. Preparing food, doing the shopping, last-minute trips to Walmart, sending out cards, children's programs, serving at a local charity. It is finished almost. And some people have asked me, how are you doing? And I've answered something like this. It's a marathon race, and I'm at mile 10, or I'm at mile 15, or perhaps tonight I can say I'm at mile 25. I still have miles to go before I sleep. I don't know about you. And when I catch my breath, we'll talk about it. But right now, I'm busy. I've had to tell so many people that. Maybe December has been a marathon race for you. How many of you are exhausted? Oh, come on, there's got to be a more, more than that. Yeah, yeah, okay, I, that's a little more honesty here. We are exhausted by the time we get to this point in December, and if you happen to feel that way, don't feel ashamed by that. You're not alone because probably most of us do feel some level of exhaustion. But no matter, we are all here tonight, we are all here, and uh, we are all good. This is a great place to be on Christmas Eve. And um, what brought you here tonight, by the way? Well, some of you are church members, longtime church members of this church, and so perhaps you come out of habit. Some of you are related to longtime church members of this church, and you came because um, other people wouldn't be anyplace else on Christmas Eve, and you uh, were feeling obligated to be here. Some of you may be visiting or checking us out. There may be some of you out there. Some of you may have just wandered in, and you don't know quite what brought you here, but nonetheless, you're here. Some of you might not even want to be here, and I don't know what all your stories all are, but it, it's all good. It's all good because we're all here, and it's all good. In fact, I'll tell you something. I don't believe that it is any accident that any of you are here tonight. This is not by chance that you are in this service. And the reason I can say that is because we believe in a God who desires to have meaningful fellowship with all of us, with all human beings, and of course, that includes each of you. You see, time and time again in the Bible, God encounters ordinary people who are just going about their lives. And I'm sure many of these Bible characters ask the same kinds of questions that you and I ask. You ask questions uh, that uh, we're tempted to ask at this time of year. Why am I working so hard? For what am I working? Why am I running this marathon race anyhow? And is there any reward for perhaps being good, trying to be a good person, trying to do the right, when it seems like there are so many evil people who seem to be doing quite well. Will my life always be this way? Will it get uh, worse in 2024 or will it get better? And does my work, the thing that I slave after day after day, does my work really have any ultimate value to it? Does my life have any ultimate value? And if it has value, then who values it? Am I truly loved? And if I wasn't able to do any of that, that I do day in and day out, would I still be loved? Am I loved? Am I worth being loved? And at the end of it all, when I die, well, what happens to me then? Who will be there for me? Now, these are universal questions. All of us ask these questions or some variation of those questions and it transcends all culture and all time. These are the questions that if you are a human being that you ask and that perhaps keep you up some nights 
And the characters who we find in the Bible, especially in the Christmas story, are no different than you and me. We're going to take a look at Joseph tonight. Joseph, who was a carpenter. He was a blue-collar worker, just, just a regular guy. You know, we might even say just a regular Joe. And there must have been a million regular Joes in the Middle East at this time. Joseph, the one who uh, we read about in our Christmas story, was a good man. Our Scripture says that he was just, meaning not only did he do the right thing, but that he was also merciful and he was kind, he was honest, he was a straight shooter. That was Joseph, and that was his story. And he might very well have said, well, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And what is your story? You see, life presents itself to us in story form. We have a beginning and we have an end. We have a plot in between and we have characters in that story. Story is how we understand life. If you ask somebody who they are, they might very well launch into a few stories. Story is how we understand our lives, and like everyone back then, Joseph's story was scripted out for him by his culture. Joseph and Mary had a marriage that was arranged by their parents, most likely. Jewish man marries good Jewish girl. They have a family. Dad works. Mom raises the kids and keeps the house. They obey the law and try to be the best people that they can be and take whatever joy comes along the pathway. Now, if you are righteous enough, maybe life after death will reward you for being good in that culture. And that would be the good life. Possibly, possibly God will see fit to call you among the righteous and you have a life perhaps a resurrected life in some eternity. But then something happens to Joseph in our story. God enters the picture and suddenly the story turns to crisis. At this point, Joseph's good life story just completely comes apart at the seams. Can you imagine the conversation? Some of you have been parents of unwed teens some of you have been uh, unwed teens yourselves, if I might uh, dare to say so tonight. You've been in a crisis situation that may involve a pregnancy, and you know how that story goes. Okay, so who's the father? Who's the father? And Mary says, um, the Holy Spirit. All our Scripture says is that Mary was found to be pregnant. That's an understatement. You can fill in the blanks. The fact is that Mary was present, but not by Joseph. And by Jewish law, Mary could be stoned to death for the sin of adultery. This is a God-induced crisis, if there ever was one. You see, the Christmas story is not about the good life or morality or comfort or being successful. And believe me, I, I'm not one of these pastors who preaches against those things. Those are all good things. But the Christmas story is not about all that. The Christmas story is about salvation. It's about meeting God in this person of Jesus. And that should lead each and every one of us to a question, to a crisis point of our own, a crisis similar in many aspects to that of Mary and Joseph. And the crisis is this. The question comes to us in this way. Do I stick to my own storyline? I've been writing this story, let's say, since I was a young child. Do I stick to that storyline and the way that I think things ought to be ordered, the way that I think things ought to happen? Or do I surrender my storyline to forces greater than me? And for Mary, that question becomes how do I make room for this baby? Well, that was a baby Jesus, but of course, Jesus grew up to be a man, although unlike any other. And in Jesus' life, in his wild love for humanity, he ends up dying a horrible death upon the cross 
to give his life, as he put it, as a ransom for many. And then just as he predicted, on the third day, he rose from his tomb and conquered death for all humanity, for all who would believe in him. Do we take someone who does that for us and write him out of our script? And believe me, many people do just that. You know, they start off perhaps with Jesus. Maybe they begin life being baptized. But somehow or another, as time goes on, they find a way to write Jesus out of their story, to write God out of their story. So do I do that? Or do I let my little story become part of a much bigger story? Do I surrender my story to God? G Joseph decides to quietly divorce Mary. He thinks he's, he's found a solution. Uh, he, he's found a solution that uh, certainly uh, would be sparing her some shame. And that's certainly better than stoning but it couldn't have brought Joseph any joy. Abortion wasn't an option, especially for a righteous man like Joseph. But sadly, instead of aborting the baby, Joseph decides to abort the marriage. And remember, Joseph is a righteous man. Joseph is a good man. He is just, and he is kind, and he's gracious. In his own goodness and in his own righteousness, this is the best that he can do with this unwanted pregnancy, this life that is being imposed upon him. That is the best that he can do. Joseph, doing the best that he can, is about to write God out of his script. In our righteousness, if we rely upon our goodness, that's what we do. We do the best that we can, and yet we know that somehow or another it has missed the mark. Some of you have been there. Maybe some of you are there tonight. That's the best that we can do. That's the best that the best of us can do. But here's the good news. And the good news is this. God has a better script. He's got a better script for Joseph, and he's got a better script for you and me than any of us with our best efforts can come up with. And it's not based on our good efforts or our righteousness. It's not based on some concept of the good life. It's God's gift. It's His grace. And so the Scripture says that the angel says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived of her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is out and out unmitigated grace toward Joseph. And suddenly, Joseph finds himself at the very cradle of redemption history. Because the name Jesus means God will save. Jo God speaks his word to Joseph, and Joseph is saved. He's delivered from human wisdom and humanly generated righteousness. He's saved out of his own story and into the very center of redemption history. But let's face it, he's no longer the main character, not even of his own story. Did you realize that in the Bible that Joseph, the husband of Mary, has no spoken words at all? If this were a script, it would be a script without any kind of dialogue for Joseph. He's no longer the main character of his own story. Yet his role was absolutely essential in protecting and preserving the life of Mary and her son. You see, when Jesus becomes a part of our lives, our stories become part of a much bigger story. It's the biggest story of all, really, because the story of Jesus is nothing less than salvation and the destiny of humanity. There's no doubt for most of us that the Christmas story is big, but most of us don't plan to live out our stories on the world stage. At least I think that's true of most of us. It's great that the Christian faith has over two and a half billion adherents in the world and that Jesus has gone global. That's wonderful. It's great that we can be part of a much bigger story. But our lives and our problems are played out on a much smaller stage. 
and all those questions we have. Am I running this race for nothing? What about these uh, disturbing test results that I've just got from my doctor? I wonder if there's any point to being a good person anymore. Does my work and my life have any ultimate value? Or am I just on some kind of treadmill? What's going to happen when I die? Is there a happy afterlife for me? And perhaps the one that moves the deepest inside, am I ultimately loved? These concerns are ultimately personal, intensely personal. And the question ha is not really, and maybe, maybe the question has never been whether Christianity as a redemption story is big enough for us. The question is, is it small enough for us? Is it small enough to somehow get inside of us? The answer, of course, is the same as what the angel of the Lord told Joseph and Mary. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And so when the Lord of the universe entered this world, he became tiny, no more than a single living cell to begin with. And Mary, who carried this embryo, became the first disciple. May it be to me as you have spoken. You see, Mary shows us something about what it means to truly walk with Jesus. The truth is that Christ is not just with those who believe in him. He intends to be in us as well. Jesus said to a woman at a well one day, whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In another passage at a festival celebrating the gift of water, Jesus tells a whole lot of people, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And let me translate that for a moment. This is the kind of satisfaction that we long for. This is the kind of satisfaction that we look for. And if we want salvation on a personal level, if we want it to hit our hearts and hit the places where we actually live, this is what Jesus offers to us, a kind of satisfaction which is personal, and it is internal, and it cannot be lost. That's why at Christmas time, you know, we sing that carol, Oh, Little Town of Bethlehem, and I know that some people think, well, you know, it's kind of a hard tune to sing, but I want uh, that, that line in there, cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. It's profound in its meaning. That new birth, that embryonic life that God implants in us is nothing and no one less than Jesus. And his life in us is that well of water that springs up inside of us to eternal life. That's a picture of a life cleansed from sin. It's a picture of life filled with deep satisfaction and refreshment and peace. This is what the angel told the shepherds. I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all people. Once again, God desires a relationship with each one of us. And Jesus died for our sins on the cross so that we might be cleansed and renewed in our inner being. But the question remains, are you willing to surrender your story to him? Are you willing to be impregnated with Jesus, impregnated with Christ? Like Joseph and Mary and the shepherds, those who do make space for Jesus surrender their old stories and live out a new and much greater story. But God's purposes for us are no less important. And here's where this really meets the road. You have a purpose. You have a destiny. There is a reason why you are here tonight. There is a purpose to your life. There is a script that God wishes to write with you. Don't worry about whether it's a big or small role, whether it is a highly esteemed role in the eyes of people or completely overlooked. 
Remember, Joseph had no spoken lines. Your role is essential. Your role is essential to someone's eternal salvation. You might be just a regular Joe or a regular Jane. You might think that you have a bit part with a few spoken lines or none. It doesn't matter. You have a purpose in God's plan. And you might be saying, okay, but I have no idea what my purpose in God's redemptive history is. And maybe even the language of that sounds like something that uh, some pastor or a guy from seminary would say. You wouldn't even phrase it that way. But you might just be saying, you know, I'm, I'm just Joseph. I'm just Mary. Don't worry about how ordinary you feel or how insignificant a role that you think you might have been given. And by the way, I, I don't think that anyone in this room tonight is playing an insignificant role. Don't worry about that. And remember, it's no accident that you're here. There's a reason. If it's because you're needing some faith strengthening or reassurance that this is all true, great, fantastic. If you're here because this is the tradition of your family, well, God bless you. We're glad that you're here tonight. If you feel that you're needing a course correction, a minor course correction, or maybe even a major one. That's fantastic. I believe that we can help. You know, this church is far from perfect. I've been here only nine months, and already I know that. I know that it's far from perfect because the pastor is far from perfect, and uh, God is far from complete in, in, in my life. He's, he's not done yet. He's not done in your lives either. We are far from a perfect church. But one thing that I think that we try to get right, one thing is that Jesus Christ is the answer to all of the things that we face in life. And if this is you tonight, if, if you're needing a course correction, then I can encourage you with this. Keep in touch. Keep in touch. Give us a call. Make some time. Whatever your situation, God means to pour out his love upon you personally. And just let the life of Christ grow in you. Hand him your script. Take the script of your life and hand it over to Jesus and let him take care of all of the rewrites that need to be done. And he will guide you into his purposes. God, grant to us the grace this Christmas to surrender to his purpose and may his light and his life and his love fill you with unspeakable joy. Will you please bow your heads and pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, our God, tonight once again we celebrate your birth. And Lord, as a church, as believers, we celebrate your birth not as just something that happened externally, though praise God, it is a historic event and a historical event. But we thank you, Lord, that in celebrating that, we also celebrate the fact that by mysterious means we know not of, that you can be born in us so that we become born again. And so we pray tonight, Lord, that you come to each and every person that you touch each and every heart, that with your divine word, your Holy Spirit is also at work so that we may find purpose in you, so that we might find new and rewritten scripts in you, and that we might find the joy that surpasses all understanding, the peace that the world cannot understand, and the love that we so long for. We pray this, Lord Jesus, in your most precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We'll continue to worship by the giving of our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Savior. 
Let us pray. On this holy night, dear Father, we rejoice to hear the good news of great joy that a Savior has been born for us, for fulfilling your prophecies and in the fullness of time sending your Son to be our Savior. We give you heartfelt thanks and praise. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. What a great mystery of our faith this is that God has become fully human for our salvation. Even though He is the all-powerful Lord of all, He is wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Help us always believe that this precious child was born as our substitute to be our Savior. In the midst of our joy, we grieve for the many people in our world who do not know that Jesus has come to bring them forgiveness and healing. As the shepherds spread abroad the good news of the birth of the Savior born for all the world, may we also make use of the unique opportunities this season presents to tell others of what we have seen and heard concerning the child. Grant that the true peace between God and fallen humanity may comfort all people. As the angels sang out their praise, Move us also to sing out our praise to you today and every day as the joy of Christmas remains in our hearts. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. We hear the gospel, the good news which is preached to us by St. John, the first chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, 
was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. As Jesus came into the world, and as his life was the light of the world, he passed on his life to his disciples. And also, by passing on his life, he has passed on his light to them as well. And we are his disciples. And so even as Jesus says, I am the light of the world, so he also calls us who have trusted in him the light of the world and says, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. As the ushers come forward, we will begin to distribute that light as a signification of the fact and the truth that Jesus, who is life, and the light of the world has passed on his light to each of us.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our God and our Savior, our highest praise and our deepest gratitude to you who has come into our world out of sheer love you have come to give your life to us to be a ransom to be our guide to be a friend to die for our sins to be raised for our justification and to live ever at the right hand of the Almighty Father to make intercession for us. We praise you and we thank you, O Lord, that you have not only come for us, but through your sovereign grace, you have deigned to take up residence in our lives. And so we pray, Lord, that your word and your spirit will have accomplished once again the miracle of new birth in us. To your glory, for the sake of your kingdom, and for your name's sake, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may extinguish your candles, and at this time, please rise for the singing of our closing song, Joy to the World, Unspeakable Joy.
the Lord. 